Hello. A very good morning on this beautiful summer Sunday. My name is Aisha, and on behalf of Param Investments, I extend a grand welcome to each one of you. Pleased to introduce Param Investments, a leading mutual funds distribution house, insurance, and investment firm established in 2005 by Mr. Rahul Khatri. What started as a very small office of three members has now expanded to three establishments in the same building with 16 members today. We are proud to say that we have grown tremendously in the past few years and have also come up with new additions to our services like our very own app, Param Investments, which is available on Play Store and iOS app. Also, we have modified our website for a more seamless customer experience. As a leading distribution house for mutual funds, insurance, life and general, corporate fixed deposits, Government of India bonds, we have earned a reputation of excellence in our field. Today we have over 4,000 customers spread across not only in India, but also apart from India and outside. In India, we are present in Mumbai, Bangalore, West Bengal, Delhi. And outside India, we have customer base in UK, US, Australia, some parts of Europe, Hong Kong, Indonesia, and Dubai. We have assets under management of more than 400 crores. At Param Investments, we are proud of our commitment to customer satisfaction, and our team works really hard to provide the best possible services to our clients. Our success is a testament to our clients' trust in over the years, and we have remained committed to providing them with the best possible investment solutions. It is my pleasure to invite on the stage the face of this organization, the face of Param Investments, Mr. Rahul Khatri. Good morning, friends. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful feeling for me today to see all of you all come in such big numbers. Uh, this has been happening after actually three years. 2019 was the last that we did the event. And because of the pandemic, we were not able to do it. A lot of your requests have come in saying that, when are you doing it? Last year also, we wanted to do the same. But due to COVID reasons, we said that it's better to avoid for a year and then come back roaring. We feel really happy and elated to have you as a crowd over here. Uh, my journey as such has been since 2005, the organization started. Today, I feel my organization as a child, which I started, has become an adult today. It's been 18 glorious years for us. And we are really happy and privileged that our team members have also been increasing. And we would be striving to get the best possible services out for you all. Uh, that is our endeavor, more so. Uh, being uh, 18 years as such, it has been a good run so far. And uh, I would like to invite today uh, Mr. Anthony Heredia, who has been a uh, uh, speaker for today as such. And uh, please help us to grace this occasion, Mr. Anthony. May I request you to please welcome Mr. Anthony? Thank you. Mr. Anthony Heredia is a chartered accountant and carries about 26 years of experience in the investment management industry. The senior roles held by him in the mutual fund business include the Managing Director of Morgan Stanley Investment Management, CEO and Whole Time Director of Baroda Asset Management India Limited, and the Chief Executive Officer of BOI AXA Investment Managers Private Limited. He has extensive experience and possesses a very strong understanding of sales and marketing within the business domain of investment. His social causes that interest him are revolved around health, children, economic empowerment, and education. A warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you. And today, Mr. Anthony is with us to educate our audience and share some of his views and discuss with you this very relevant topic, which has now become a concern. 
Is recession coming to India? Without further ado, I would request Mr. Anthony to please raise the dice and share some of his insights. Thank you. Thank you. Well, firstly, let me thank Param. Let me thank Rahul, uh, someone I've known for more than 18 years, uh, longer than Param. Uh, at the outset, I want to, you know, you notice that the one thing I've already done, which is a mischievous thing, is I've changed the title of my presentation. Uh, the title is, is Recession Coming to India? And I thought, you know, if we spend the next 45 minutes to an hour talking about doom and gloom, it's not a best way to spend a Sunday uh, morning. Uh, the second is, frankly, recession is something you relate to economy. And what you are here today and the reason you are customers and clients of Param is because you invest money. You invest money not in an economy. You invest money in markets, right? And so I thought it's probably more apt to look at the conversations around recession uh, more in the context of markets. and. Frankly, as you'll see through the presentation, our observation is that there are perhaps more opportunities that arise out of this rather than need reasons to panic. Uh, all of you, I'm assuming, Rahul, they are all investors in mutual funds. Uh, I want to first clarify, I will not be talking about Mahindra Manulife even for a second because this is not the occasion to do it. But since you're all mutual fund investors, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that mutual funds are subject to market risk, blah, blah, blah. But I thought in an occasion like this, it is very important to put another risk factor, okay? Uh, and that is this. I don't come here to give gyan. Okay, yaha pe sab gyan hai. So let us have that perspective, right? Because uh, the only thing with gyan are markets. All of us are subservient to it. So all I will attempt to do is I have a long presentation with lots of slides, but I am not going to go into detail in those slides. It is just about various things that we find at one level interesting and at another level relevant for us to make decisions about how we invest, why we invest, right? Because there is nothing in investing which is absolute, right? There is nothing which is a screaming buy or a screaming sell. Everything always has to be seen relative to the situation. Let me therefore first come to the topic which is the headline of the conversation, whether is recession coming to India, is recession potentially creating an opportunity. And if you actually look at the dictionary meaning of recession, it's an extremely boring definition that beyond a point nobody will understand except to say that things don't look nice. But I think the first thing to look at is what is recession relevant in our context of investing and to me there are different facets and recession has different meanings within all of those facets, right? If you start with the first thing, when you think about the mind, because every day you pick up the paper, you look on Twitter or whatever medium you typically gather information, it almost seems like, you know, in COVID obviously it felt like the world is coming to an end. and. Frankly, in my 26 years, and I have been an investor longer than that, there's never been a year in which there is no such news that perhaps predicts that things are coming to an end, right? There's always positives and there are always negatives. And one of the things that is important when it comes to investing is you've got to make sure that your mind is not consumed with this, right? It is just a matter of fact. And one of the things that from a, if you think about recession and you think about your mind, it's important to kind of, at some point in time, divorce yourself from that. And make sure that when you think about making decisions, they're absolutely rational decisions. The second is geography. Should we be so obsessed about recession, which is actually a discussion that is more in the Western world, right? If an economy grows at five, six, seven percent like India, why are we even having the word recession in a topic of discussion? Right? We are amongst the fastest growing economies in the world over the last couple of years. Most people, not when I say most people, it is not nationalist Indians. Most people outside India believe that we will be amongst the fastest growing economies of the world. So to what extent is recession really then a geographical context? Right? The, you have to take the context that recession is a subject that people in the US are discussing and debating because it impacts their lives in more ways than one. Uh, 
the only context i will say from an investing perspective in india we must think about is that in our ambition as an economy and i'm clarifying right now we're still discussing economy we are not discussing investing which is really why you are here not to basically we are not going to leave this room all as amateur economist right uh, is that one of the ambitions that india clearly has in its journey is that it will become a larger and larger part of the global framework and to that extent if large parts of the world are going through difficulty then it is relevant right 25% of our gdp our exports are now 25% of gdp that's a relevant number so if the geography i would say is something you need to put in context in recession it's about that aspect it's not really related. india is not in a recession it is not close to one it neither will be in one in many years to come the economy i anyway spoke about right uh, ultimately if i you take my last comment if we are 25% of our gdp today is exports then to that extent if the world goes through difficult times naturally it has an impact on how our economic growth happens uh how does it impact earnings this is the starting point where it starts to impact your investments right at the end of the day how does a company make money company makes money because the larger environment in which the company operates is growing so if the larger environment doesn't grow as much the opportunity for the company to grow basically reduces and last which i think is the subject that most investors tend to ignore is valuation right in markets there is nothing that is good or bad it is everything is good or bad relative to the price at which you pay and i would just translate it to any normal purchase decision i mean it's kind of ironic but it gives me a great opportunity to give you an example we're sitting in a supermarket right and you walk into a supermarket store and any item that you would want to purchase you have a reference price in your mind and frankly whether it's a good buy or a bad buy more often than not is not related to the product the product hasn't changed it's really the price at which you're being able to buy it right and so therefore when you think about recession when you think about all the other possible impacts if because of that i am able to buy it at a price that i never would have had to been able to buy that in time will turn out to be the best decision you could have made so recession is not your enemy right can you repeat this sir what i'm saying is if everybody predicts doom and gloom and then eventually as a consequence markets collapse and you have the shall i say common sense and maturity to look at it as an opportunity and buy eventually the result of that in 5 or 10 years is far superior than if we are discussing global growth never seen before but obviously it will be available at a price never seen before as well so therefore 5 years from now you may turn around and say oh things were looking very good but somehow my portfolio is which was 100 rupees is still 100 rupees right and so therefore valuations i would say is a very very important factor that you should always keep in mind another important thing to keep in mind as so this is in the context of india is that again while there is so much conversation about is the us in a recession is you know and various economists some people will argue the us has been in a recession since the september of 22 by some other definitions somebody will argue that the us will go into a recession in the quarter of july 23 uh, the point you must remember is that india because it is a relatively different economy because it's a relatively insulated economy has always grown 3 to 4% over the global gdp so beyond a point i would say obsessing about recession slow down of global growth and then translating it to mean automatically that india is suffering if you look at data and this data is extremely you know it's 23 years old would suggest and if you went you know beyond you'll realize that except for one exceptional situation which you can see which is 2020 which is covid it's the only time and that obviously as you would recognize is a once in a lifetime event where the economic growth of india was not just aligned to the drop of growth in the world it was actually even steeper and to some degree we are over that because when the re- world recovered we anyways recovered quicker so if i was to think about 2024 26 27 my assumption frankly would be from a market perspective is that the economy in india will continue to grow 3 or 4% higher than the global growth this is the 
We are the fastest to browse back and that mathematically some people would argue and I'm aware we have number of people from IIT in the room so I need to be extremely careful about mathematical concepts I apply but effectively base effect would mean that if your base is low theoretically your ability to bounce back is higher. Uh, right? The other important thing to kind of just put in, like I said, I mean, you will see lots of slides, lots of graphs, please don't get frightened. Uh, us mutual fund people like to put this to impress you as if we know lots of things. Uh, but I, like I said, I, my presentation is ideally about observations, right? Observations that I think are relevant to think about when you're making your next investing decision. I think the reason why there's so much extra conversation about recession, and you look at this chart, uh, this is an IMF forecast. Uh, I will reserve comments on IMF forecasts and how correct they are uh, for a different occasion. I'm aware we are live on YouTube, so I will resist. But I think what you'll find very interestingly is that 2023, the forecasted global growth, which is the first slide, and I'm 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 apologize to the people at the back. I'm sure you don't you can't see it, but it says the world is projected to grow at 2.8 percent versus last year where the growth was 3.4%. But if there is so much conversation that we are going into recession, how is the fact that the world is growing at 3% meaning we are going to recession? The last time I checked, and this is grade one maths, three is higher than 2.8, right? And I'll tell you the reason. If you look closer, you'll find that the two economies that are actually growing slower than 2022 or 23 is the US and China. Right? And that's why, because the media conversation, the world conversation, many countries, big export markets, or competitors to exports happen to be the US and China. And so that's why the domination of the fact that we are slowing down, we are slowing down, it's really predicated on the US. It's not so much uh, the emerging markets. The other thing that one must recognize, this actually is a point I want to make, it's a slide not too many people use. And it's an acceptance that we economists and market players should actually have. That frankly, we beyond a point have no role to play. The reason economy and markets have risen in the last 10 years is because of the unprecedented amount of liquidity that the central banks across the world have given to the world to ensure recovery. And as is natural, that kind of excess free money, quote unquote free, because it's available at an interest rate that is very, very low, finds its way into risk assets, right? And eventually you will see the correlation and just look at this correlation, it's a stunning correlation. That the correlation between central banks infusing liquidity and GDP growth subsequent is 0.97. Right? That's as close to one as you can get. Which basically to me suggests that for us the worry should not be so fundamental. You know, you have fundamental constructs of how an economy will grow or not grow, but it's actually something which is not so fundamental, just liquidity. So if you're convinced that the central banks now, and they've made it, they're very public about that, that they are going to make sure that the time of easy liquidity has long gone, and we are going to take liquidity off, you have to assume that what went up with it is going to go down with it, right? What you also have to then consider in context, and which is why I changed the title to saying opportunity in recession, is that if recessionary fears become more real, the courage of the central banks to withdraw liquidity will go down. Because beyond a point, they also know that the one way you basically resurrect an economy is effectively to lower rates and provide liquidity. So if at all, you would put it, let me put it differently. If we were not having any recessionary fears, my prediction is actually we would have been into greater trouble because the central banks would have withdrawn even more liquidity. And if this correlation was to hold, we would have had even slower growth, except that we wouldn't have expected it. Now we have a situation where we are expecting growth to be lower. And in reality, what is eventually going to happen is the central banks will react and say, I can't keep withdrawing liquidity. I can't keep increasing rates. And while I'm digressing, this is exactly what happened a month and a half back with SVB, right? Which is that there is an unintended impact of what the central banks are doing. Because you have a ton of banks which, as part of the way they do business, are required to buy government securities, bonds, etc. 
and frankly while they are buying bonds which are supposed to mature in 25 or 2030 or 35 they are sitting on massive mark to market losses and how does the bank operate i mean all of us bank right i mean does the bank ever tell us when we go saying that yes i understand it's a savings account but you know what i actually invested in 2030 so you can't come and take your money today right so there's an absolute disconnect between the liability that a bank has which is the liability to pay back a deposit at a point in time the li liability to pay back your amounts left in a savings bank and the investments it makes normally it's not relevant because the world moves in normal silos but just consider this the us 2 years ago had interest rates of 1% today it has 5 and a half right so just imagine the value of a bond that you bought at 100 rupees is actually worth 80 and that is something that banks like svb for example didn't even have in their accounts i know we have a very long time for q and a so which is why i'm in the interest of that just running through and making these observations because we can discuss and debate and come back to any of these slides uh, at a point in time so i want to switch gears therefore now that let's say we've discussed recession in a slightly different context uh what is the opportunity and i think the opportunity in india is frankly a very different opportunity it's an opportunity that one should think about through i would say different prisms not the classical prisms which says which sectors look good which sectors look bad which should i buy small cap should i like mid caps but one could almost turn this now into an election rally speech but that is reality the way india potentially is transforming and i use the word potentially extremely carefully because it may not happen but there is a very very clear thing that is happening in our country which i would say you as investors must start to recognize and appreciate because i believe that should create your optimism for example about investing in equity far more than anything else right far more than if the sensex dropped 20% so it's classically always a good time to buy the first is this this is how india is transforming right the formalization of the economy why is it relevant for us from a markets perspective because formalization of an economy is again an extremely technical term it's very simplistically the fact that take for example something like gst and i'm sure there would be a number of business owners in this room right the fact that that brings goods and services being sold far more in favor of the organized sector versus the unorganized is a huge thing right and then you would tend to argue that potentially it is the organized sector that will be listed in the market not the unorganized right so effectively the more and more the country's growth the country has historically grown at 5 6% but the more that 5 6 7% is reflected in formal businesses which eventually find parts in the market that is an opportunity right that you should see the second is digitization people tend to look at digitization from a perspective which is very much close to them personally right i see a lot of young people in the room that is reflected as twitter insta stuff like that uh for a lot of people digital means the most immediate remembrance is covid right and how we managed to encounter and go through covid was because of technology that's the classic argument and i can guarantee you that every single person in the room negotiated covid differently from each other everybody used technology and digital in some form but the biggest example i like to give about how digitization actually helped and will help is not because how do i place an order to get some food from zomato or how do i get groceries from blinkit it is how does tata steel still produce steel in a covid environment because they use digital and technology to keep running the furnaces right so think about for example and i did actually promise that i would not plug mahindra manual life but i can't unfortunately resist from plugging mahindra as an example right just think of the car 
historically anybody in this room would have pegged bmw audi and mercedes at a particular level because yes obviously it's aspirational value it is brand value but everybody will also argue that the quality of things that are there in the car are not in any other car and what digital and technology has done is as mahindra i can now acquire every single thing that audi and bmw acquires and put it into a car and if i can deliver that car to you 35% cheaper i will have a waiting period of 2 years right and that's what companies like the mahindras or companies like the tatas are doing it's effectively what happened to the phone industry how many of you and there are i can see many gray head people like me right nokia and motorola were the only two phones they don't exist today the reason they don't exist today is because every small component in a phone is available as a technology input so i can tomorrow decide to shut a mutual fund and decide to make a phone and i don't have to know how to make a phone i just have to have the business acumen of figuring out who is going to supply me the best components at scale to create a phone and that's how digitalization is going to change the way companies operate and i think it's very relevant because when a when you think of it from a market's perspective you know there's this historical term called blue chip you know there are blue chip stocks i think one change you should expect and this is not related to recession this is just related to the way our country has evolved the success stories of the next 10 years can easily come from unexpected places because some company is going to use digitization or formalization better than someone who's established right so the biggest paint company in 7 years is not surely going to be asian paints but let me also tell you that the reason asian paints for example is the largest paint company is because it adopts technology like nobody else so if you go and for example talk to somebody in asian paints a dealer and you will say that you get lower margin in asian paints compared to five others why do you still sell asian paints he said because asian paints has a saas platform he knows when my stock of this paint is going down and before even i can think of it there is a supply of that to me think of the working capital i need therefore to run this shop far lower than anybody else right and it's therefore a classic paint manufacturing company thinking of a way to use technology to make their business more viable the third aspect and some of this you would have referenced and seen in the papers it's not spoken of in terms of impact as much as it should which is the government's pli scheme which is what the government is basically saying that if historically one of our weaknesses as an economy has been our dependence on the outside on imports etc we need to focus on substituting that by a make in india program right so it's not so much a a war cry it actually has very fundamental economic impact right and when you have something like that you have something like gst as well what you're also finding is the government is getting all these additional collections of tax etc and it's reinvesting it right and of course we in mumbai may not really appreciate the pollution that is coming out of this reinvestment but the reality is the reason this re this all takes money right i mean you don't build metros you don't build new roads you don't concrete uh, existing roads unless you have money and i would in fact and i'm sure a lot of you travel across india this is i mean what's happening in mumbai is a microcosm of what's happening across the country and eventually understand that this creates jobs it creates income it creates spending power this is another very very big example and it's linked to the last part i said which is that if you think about how our country has evolved from an economic standpoint the first key point is that in the last 20 years the big driver to india becoming a very recognized power people saying it in the context that this is one of the large economies of the world has been services right it's been the ability for the it sector to expand dramatically it has been an opportunity for pharmaceutical companies to create generics and expand to our mind this decade if we have to become a success and i i can tell you the policies are very much is the manufacturing success right it is the percentage to which india will become a part of the global economy and that is a very very critical factor and just to put it in context india's today share of world 
GDP in terms of goods and services is 2.4 percent. China is 30 percent, right? So when you start hearing this concepts of China plus one make in India, there is a reason for it. It's a common sense reason, which is that if all the government does through PLI, etc., means that we can grab an extra percent or two from China. China is not going to care that 30 became 28, but our 2.4 becomes 4.8. That's double, right? And then you start translating it to markets. Is there a company that has actually doubled what they sell because they found a way to export or create something that in the past never was an opportunity? And which is why you find so many sectors like textiles, chemicals, etc., becoming so much more relevant in our market because those are spaces in which people are taking advantage of the opportunity. This, to my mind, is probably the toughest to get right, but this is the biggest, I would say, transformation that you could or should expect in the years to come, which is for all the successes that one has seen in the Indian economy, etc., 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 if you look at these stats, it looks like they have been basically contributed by under 5% of Indians at any point in time. Right? Why have I put Mercedes-Benz sales, right? Because it is not easy for somebody who sells cars that retail at 40, 50 lakhs, one crore, to grow at 35% compounded. For those of you in the room who are either businessmen or obviously working in a corporation, companies don't grow at 35% every year. You contrast this with the fact that in the same period of 2020, 21, and 22, two-wheeler sales in India have actually dropped 20%. So the point is that if you go to the earlier side and you talk about how India today, largest population in the world, India today, potentially the largest number of working group population in the world, those working group population are not in this one, two, three percent. So when they eventually earn money, when the per capita income of all of these working population goes up, what are they going to do with that money and potentially what kind of sectors and companies will they impact, right? Because if I am entering the working population and I earn a salary of 10 lakhs a year, I would assume I am not going to buy a Mercedes Benz, right? But there will be tons of other consumables that I will think of buying. So I think one of the transformations, and I think it's led by the point on the last, which is 6.5% of Indians use UPI. The fact that it is the highest percentage in this chart, barring the 8% uh, of car ownership, but the 8% of car ownership you would concede is a function of 30, 40 years of cars being sold, right? UPI is a three-year-old story. So it's a function of if in any economic transition, if your per capita of each individual goes up, what is it that they consume? and what they consume has impacts on what subsectors and companies. That, I think, is a transformation that in our markets you will come to see in the years ahead. And which is why I think this is the central point you should keep in mind. If, there is, if Rahul told me, come here and you have only one slide to present, you are supposed to convince all these people in the room that buying equity is not a bad thing, you have only one slide to present, right? It's like that typical for all the youngsters in the room who are doing their graduation, you start the 60 second pitch. Present yourself in 60 seconds. This is our 60 second pitch, which is if we do make it to becoming the third largest economy in the next five, six, seven years, right? What is the impact this is going to have in markets? Now you're going to say, why is it correlated? Look at the right hand side. The right hand side is 2006 to 2022. Okay, In 2006, India was the 14th largest economy in the world. And the basic point is, eventually there are some concepts that hold true across any time frame, any market, which is that the correlation between the market, which is the market cap of the market, and the GDP, is effectively in line. 
right? There may be a year it doesn't move in line, but over a three year, five year period. So you will see that over the last 16 years, our GDP grew six times. Our markets basically grew seven and a half times, right? And all the other basic numbers you see there are all derivatives of that. So the simple question you have to ask yourself is if our GDP is going to be 6 trillion in 2027, 20, 28, 29, and it is 3 trillion today, and our market cap or GDP is 4 trillion, what is it going to be? And so therefore it's almost like a cheat sheet to say that equity markets 5 years from now are going to be significantly higher than today. Or you count or you counter argue to me that no I disagree for some miraculous reason instead of 3 trillion dollars we are actually going to become 2. Right? So the point is now whether 3 becomes 6 or 3 becomes 5 whether 3 becomes 6 in 5 years or 3 becomes 6 in 6 years the point is 3 becomes 6 is double. Right? And so if you argue that eventually your market always translates that GDP in the form of a market return by a function of 1 or 1.2, effectively anybody who invests in equity, and it's of course a very silly argument I'm making, but it's actually true, should theoretically double, right? So that is something that you should keep in mind. That from all the other aspects I discussed, the formalization, the digitization, the PLI, X, Y, Z, the largest working population, eventually it's going to lead to this number in some shape or form. Which means that if you as a consumer need to benefit from it, you need to be invested. Instead of spending hours and hours reading the paper and debating about recession, small cap, valuation, price earning multiple, all of these things. You have to just put this one thing in your mind, right, and, and, and then operate on that basis. The other thing you have to also realize, and this is important to realize because this is how you are being deceived in some sense. You are seeing so much of articles and news every day about, you know, pharma is not doing well, now IT is doing well, now suddenly after Infosys result, IT is not doing well, but manufacturing is doing well, within manufacturing cement is doing well and banks are doing well, XYZ. You know why this is happening? This is not happening because those companies are doing well or not doing well. Because in a quarter things happen, right? For all of us who work in companies or run businesses, you know that. You, you know where your business is headed in a year or two. Nobody can forecast that in this quarter, this is exactly the number of by which my turnover is going to grow. But what has changed in our market is the extent to which trading dominates the way our market operates. Right? So you can actually look at this. In, this is not even 15 years. This is just 5 years. Our cash, which means people who are buying equity for the long term, every day in the market is only 0.5%. 99.5% of people who make an investment today in the market are doing it for a day. Or best a couple of days. Right? So do you really think that they are going to be even medium term focused? No. So basically what they keep doing every day is going to create volatility. It is going to create sector rotation from time to time. And therefore if you are an investor, if you are in the 0.5, you probably should argue that it is best to ignore all of this at some point. Because I think one of the worries I do have is we get consumed by this volatility and by con being consumed by the volatility, we end up doing stupid things. Right? Saying that I will now redeem or I will now invest, stuff like that. You should actually stick with the previous slide, which says GDP will double in five years. I will stay invested. During the next five years, there will be a movie that releases every Friday. One will be a horror film, one will be a comedy, one will be an absolutely romantic uh, tearjerker. But eventually, at the end of five years, the fun summation of all the movies I would have seen is I would have said I have been reasonably entertained. And because I am reasonably entertained, this is the outcome. In some ways you could argue that, yes. Right? And this is just an example of sector rotation. I mean the various colors. It will just show you how eventually each sector produces a return that 
it should given how that sector's fortunes are shaping up over the next two or three years and for those of the back who can't see this i would say it's good because the point i'm making is look at the colors changing that is the point it is not that the people in the front row can read the numbers because the numbers are not relevant. What is relevant is sector performing better than other sectors is a phenomenon that has happened before and probably will keep happening. And beyond a point, I will go back to another level which is a typical fascination that people have, right? Which is should I buy small cap fund, should I buy large cap fund, should I buy mid cap fund? The if you look at this eventually, it's if I have to coin a, a term for this, sabka time aega, right? Which effectively that means that go back to my once that slide I said was the only slide I was granted. If India is going to double in five years, various companies will do well, some companies will not do well. Why do I want to waste my time trying to forecast within that will small cap do better than mid cap because I could then argue that yes you are right but in IT large will do better, in chemical small will do better, in cement middle will do better and at the end of the day as long as you leave it to professionals to figure out hopefully what makes the most sense at a value, at the end of five years you more or less would have delivered a return for yourself which is plus or minus 0.5 or 1 percent of what you would have got had you obsessed about making sure I must also choose the type of fund that I'm going to invest in. And I am saying this to the detriment of our industry and I can tell you a is it because I'm moving a lot? Okay, anyways. Uh, because we have to convince all of you, see it's a very typical human mindset, it's not an Indian mindset, it's a human mindset. Anything new is supposed to be nice, right? So we create these new fund offers and we try to prove to you why this new fund offer makes more sense than something else. But the reality is that frankly, if you owned five diversified equity funds, you are pretty much sorted in terms of participating in that story. Instead, somehow as an industry, we convince you with having 4,000 funds for the same thing, right? And beyond mm -hmm. a point, I can share with you, it is not relevant. I don't own more than five equity funds. I'm being very honest. It just doesn't make sense. Because if I did so much of extra intellectual work on figuring out the sixth fund, I will then do it to make the seventh fund and the eighth fund and I will eventually by law of averages reach a point where I'll get an average return that the first five are going to give in the first place, right? So the message I'm trying to give you with these two slides is don't worry too much about this sector rotation. Like I said, there is a very different technical reason it's happening. If 99% of the people who buy today or sell today are doing it for today, the way they will look at a company is very different from you or me who is looking at investing for three to five years. Because they couldn't care less whether the Indian economy becomes the third largest in five years. They will effectively do something every day for those five years. There's another stat, I don't know how many of you picked up in the media, but SEBI actually did a study of these traders and they put out a report based on factual data that 89.5% of traders lost money in the last year. Right, so just imagine you are investing in equity yeah, thank you. Uh, you are investing in equity to make a double digit return, but instead 90% actually deliver a loss, which is shocking. Now, does this mean that those 90% are not going to do it again? No, because everybody thinks they're not part of the 90, right? Uh, but the point I'm trying to make again, don't obsess about this. The other thing, now this is again a complicated slide, I'm going to make this is probably the one part that does worry me in a sense and also fills me with optimism which is when you think about the markets actually and I'm picking a time frame somebody could argue you're picking a time frame that suits the point you're making but I think it's an important point in the last 18 months the returns from equity has actually been zero right but the reality is that while it has been zero 
the actual earnings of companies that comprise the market have risen very very decently so this just shows that the average profit after tax is grown from fy22 which is one year ago from 5.7 lakh crores to 6. Point, know, what the number is 6.4 lakh crores right which then means that the market is actually a lot cheaper from a valuation perspective today than it was 18 months ago why then do you have this degree of discomfort about valuations? I'll tell you why. If you look behind the numbers, you will find that at least 75% of this extra profit has come from banks. Okay, so effectively what has happened is you have a situation where you have just probably hit your peak interest rate. What the RBI, if all of you, and this is something that all of us will resonate with, is that Today, all our borrowing rates are very, very quickly linked to the change of interest rate. So if the RBI raises the repo rate, your home loan EMI is changed from the next month itself. But contrasted to the deposits that you're getting, there is easily a lag effect of six months to a year, right? Which then translates to the fact that this quarter, banks will have their record net interest margin. I am not really supposed to talk about specific companies because of regulation, but I'll just make a point. ICICI Bank just declared its results at a record name of 4.9%. One year ago, that was 4%. Now, if 90 or 70, 80% of the profit increase has happened in the banks, effectively it means that all the rest have suffered, right? Because they're the consumers of the credit that the banks give them because they're all paying higher rates, therefore they don't earn as much profits. Our view is that in the couple of years that we see going forward, the game is going to move from the lenders to the borrowers. Because once you've had interest rates peak, it basically means that the companies that were borrowing are no longer going to see an increase in cost, and effectively every growth of profits that they do translates into the p &L. And it is this transition that makes people nervous. I know I have probably overcomplicated a point, but all I'm saying is one of the reasons that probably explains the fact that in spite of, because we are taught this, right? Ultimately, market price is a slave of earnings. If a company makes more money, eventually it shows up in its stock price over time. Why then, if the profitability of the Nifty has increased so much, why is the last 18 months zero? The reason is because 70% of it is in the banks, right? The moment that moves from the banks to the borrowers, which is the other subset of industries, you will actually probably have a scenario where the profitability doesn't grow as much, but the market starts to grow. And so therefore, I just want to end this section with a comment on valuations, which is just purely to make this point. In fact, when I saw this slide, I actually did a double take. I actually asked my CEO, I said, you know, this is so weird. We are in the market. We don't understand it. Look at this point. Okay, this is the average of the market valuation in the last 10, 15 years. Now, it's an advantage for you, those of you at the back, because I can actually be a little more dramatic. If I gave you, I said, close your eyes, I'm giving you a chance to go back to that day of COVID, March 2020, and invest. How much would you invest? I think the answer would be, I would not only invest what I had, I would borrow from my neighbor, and I would invest that also, because... But the reality is that number is the average. Today, we are 10% above the average, but look at the fear in our minds, right? Because the times when markets were significantly under that was the 2008 financial crisis and the 2001 tech bust. But COVID, which in hindsight you will say was the, I wish to God, I was not so fearful. I wish to God I didn't think the market is going to come to an end. Right? I wish I listened to Rahul. But I will tell you this in all honesty of disclosure. Even I didn't invest more. Even I didn't. Right? But I'm just saying if you told me in hindsight you have a chance to backdate and go and put a transaction, I will invest every single thing I could. But yet, you know, it's like going back to the Heiko Sukha market 
argument, right? I'm going to buy a pair of shoes, it's 2,000 bucks, right? In hindsight, I now know that that shoe is 4,000, so 2,000, if you give me a chance to buy, obviously I'll buy it. But when I'm telling you it is 2,200, today you're saying, no, 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 no. It's too expensive, you know, there is a recession, you know, there's an election coming next year, monsoon forecast, climate said, it may be below X, Y, Z. And to my mind, again, I go back to my that slide. If by 2028, 20, 29, India is a $6 trillion economy, effectively your market returns will get dealt with that. The problem is we obsess about this stuff. So I'm not going to spend time on this again because this is something I've already spoken of. So very, very quickly, the reality is economy. It's clear that globally, people believe the global growth is going to be lower over 2023 and 24. But like I say, when you bring the valuation context, I would argue that some of it, if not a lot of it, is in the price, right? So it's not some new thing that we've discovered. Uh, US Fed, and the point I made, recession could actually be your friend rather than your enemy because a Fed that was super confident about taking out liquidity and increasing rates so that it will somehow control inflation is now being forced to rethink, right? Uh, the Indian economy, reality is the linkage practically is to the RBI and what the RBI does. And our view is that the pause where Governor Das was at pains to stress that this is a pause. This doesn't mean I may not raise rates. The last 20 year data and history of the RBI suggests that whenever they have paused, it has actually meant the end. Right? So we would believe that rates in India, we've seen the peak of rates. And I would also argue while this is more a discussion and presentation on equity, as a central point to those of you who buy fixed income, this is probably the time to lock into long-term fixed income. Because rates going forward will drop. That's a given. Key monetarables, I'm not going to get into details, but I will just make one point. I don't think people pay enough attention to China as they should because it is the world's last major economy to come out of COVID. And if you look at all major economies as they've come out of COVID, they have generally surprised in terms of what they have done. And China being as large as it is, how they take care of their post-COVID world, and we must be aware that it is the one large economy where control is centralized so they can decide what they want to do, has an implication on commodity prices, it has an implication, for example, just think of it, you know, China is not necessarily our friend, right? Today's wars are not only fought on nuclear weapons and guns and machinery. Today's wars are economic. I spoke about, if you remember, the fact that today we are 2.4% of the world's GDP in terms of goods and services. If we got an extra 1-2%, would China really mind? No. But because it's India, China may mind. Right? And so somebody will make a policy to say, oh, if there are Indian chemical companies that are unnecessarily growing fast, I will pur purposely do stuff to ensure that it's okay if Taiwan actually does well, but India shouldn't. So one of the points I would just make out of all of this uh, besides the Russia, Ukraine, besides the oil price, I think the elephant in the room and the thing to watch very, very closely is how China tackles the next year in terms of how it wants to recover from a post-COVID world. From a market's perspective, like I said, it's quite clearly a valuation-based buy that I would say. But again, I would say more than obsessing about whether it's a buy today or a buy tomorrow, it's about taking a call if by in another five years, India is going to be in a very different spot. Do I want to be a participant or do I want to be a bystander? That's the basic call you have to make. So with this I'm good. So, So 
point I'm making is that eventually we can discuss so many economic concepts, so many market concepts. Eventually, investing successfully is more a way of controlling your emotions and doing the right common sense thing than anything else. Right? In our world, we call him the Godfather, and I'm, actually, I think if I was to give one advice in the context of all these multiple observations I gave you, it's almost to say that at this juncture, I would request you to ignore all of them, focus on the one slide I told you to focus on, which is, is India going to be the third largest economy? And then think about these facts, because these are facts of markets over the last 100 years. They will be facts of markets over the next 100 years as well, which is human behavior is what will create market excesses on either side. Okay. Number two, any market excess presents an opportunity. That's a given. And I'm defining excess not in only a positive context. Like I said, therefore, if there's an over-reliance on discussing the impact of recession, global recession on India, it is 100% going to present an opportunity at some point, right? Which is the third point. Opportunities are not only one way. You must remember this. Your role as an investor is not only to invest. Your role as an investor sometimes is to also not invest. Right? Because the same excesses don't only work one way. We are sales guys. We will always come and tell you that, look 10 years down the line, this is the rosy picture you should invest. But sometimes it is important for you to look at your own portfolios. If you are reasonably invested in terms of reaching your goals, then you have to stop if you believe the markets are excessive. Because that's what Warren Buffett does, right? Anecdotally, and I know sometimes now I see from some investors a conversation about China, uh, sorry, Taiwan equity, right? Remember in context that Warren Buffett just sold a huge position in his Taiwan semiconductor company. So did a U.S. senator, right? So contrast it. Here everybody is so excited, 40% return over last three, four months. We must surely buy a Taiwan equity fund. But... Godfather just basically said, maybe I know something you don't, and I'd like to actually exit the 40%. And so effectively making money from equity the Godfather way, which I would like to leave with you because I genuinely believe it. I wish I practiced it, but at least I can say that you believe it, is that ideally the first way you make money in markets is you must have money to invest. right? So that's the starting point. The second is patience. And the third is courage. Because like I said, every Friday there will be a movie. It's important to kind of look past the movie and stay the course and remember my slide about third largest economy. I know there are a lot of young people in this room. I'm not used to presenting to young people, although I have a session next uh, Sunday to a, a bunch of teenagers, so that'll be exciting. But I can't resist uh, and I, to use the opportunity to tell all of you certain things. I have only three more slides, so bear with me. This slide actually is applicable to some ways to everybody in the room. Now you may wonder, it doesn't seem like it's related to markets, but there's a lesson I'd like you to take. So I'll read out the letter because I'm sure. So this is a letter from Sharon to her parents. Dear mom and dad, sorry for not having written to you for a long time. I will bring you up to date now, but before you read any further, please sit down. I am doing quite good now. The skull fracture I got when I jumped out of the hostel, when it caught fire, has healed completely. I spent almost two weeks in the hospital, but I can now see properly and I get headaches only occasionally. Fortunately, the fire in the hostel was seen by the watchman and he alerted the fire department immediately. He also came to see me in the hospital and now, since our hostel is completely burnt, he offered to share his room with me. It's a bit small, and, but he's a nice and caring individual and we've fallen in love. I am pregnant, but he says he'll marry me before I deliver our baby whose test reports are all fine. I'm sure you must be all excited to welcome our little angel in the family. Okay. Now you turn the page, because the letter is not finished. And he says, now that I've told you everything, I wanted to say that our hostel had not caught fire. I didn't have a fracture, I am not seeing anyone, I am not pregnant, 
and there is no boyfriend. However, I have failed in economics and marketing. <laughs> I just wanted you to see my result in the proper perspective, your loving daughter Sharon. Right? And that's why I'm saying that for all the gyan I gave you about markets and economy, etc., eventually remember that one slide and look at anything you read, absorb in perspective. For the young people in this room, I, you know, you can, I can have a 45 slide presentation, but I'm going to pick just two concepts I want all of you to, to listen to and imbibe. The one thing is that, the, as we in financial services call it, the eighth wonder of the world is the power of compounding. Right? You invest something at 12%, then that becomes 112 and that gets 12% more and so on and so forth. I'll just start with, you know, just to make it fun, Let's just try and get a guessing game. No, one rupee, we will just double the one rupee every day. So everybody has one rupee, you double it at the end of every day. What do you think that will be at the end of the month? Yes. Okay, three million, so that's 30 lakhs. Okay, so you are pegging your answer here. Okay, fine. Anybody else wants to take a guess? One rupee, it will double every day. So after 30 days, what do you think it will be? Okay, in the interest of time, I'll tell you what the answer is. And to the young people in this room especially, but also to the older people in this room, because this is genuinely the power of compounding, this is what it will be. 53.69 crores. Okay, that, and please take out your calculators, do it in an Excel sheet. In fact, on the 31st day, it becomes 107 crores because it doubles every day, but that's not the point. The point is that's the power of compounding. And the second and far more important message I would like to give the young people in this room, because for people like me, unfortunately, it's too late to listen to this message. I picked some of this anyways, uh, which is the cost of delay. Right? What, as youngsters, you have the biggest benefit is the fact that you're young. Right? You can actually start investing. So this is another example. So Rohit started at the age of 25, invested 5,000 a month. Right? I've taken 12% as a typical mean average return one would expect at equity. Kept doing this till the age of 55, gets 1.76 crores. And Mohit is somebody who says, no, no, hang on, I need to go to the pub, I need to spend money, etc., etc. I have no time and energy. So there is actually that 5,000 that is in Mohit's bank account. But Mohit doesn't invest. But by the time Mohit is 45 and somehow he has a lot more responsibilities in life, you know, he no longer can rent, he'd like to buy a house, etc., etc. He says, now I should invest. So he starts at 45, but obviously he has, you know, he's worked for a while, earns a lot more money, so he invests 15,000, three times the amount, same 12%, same 55. Look at the difference, 34 lakhs. Right? So if at all there is one message I would give all the young people in this room, and in theory, I would give actually anybody that if you have money lying in your bank account that you're absolutely sure you have nothing to do with, then it would be absolutely criminal to leave it there, investing it, even if it seems like, what's the point, 15 years, kisne deka? Because this is the difference. To catch up with Rohit, Mohit has only two choices. If he's got to get the 1.7 crores, he's got to find an investment that gets 36%, which is why so many people bought crypto in the urge to catch up. Right? We know what happened to that. Or save 75%, the 75,000 a month, which you could argue changes Mohit's lifestyle quite radically relative to 15,000. So I would again reiterate to all the younger people in this room and the older people in this room the first message. Forget all of the stuff on economy, etc. I told you. Keep things in perspective. It's fairly simple. You have money. Invest in the right stuff. Have patience. Have courage or have the ability to just block all the noise off. You will become wealthier. Because you are fortunate to be in India in an economy which is in any case is going to deliver it for you. Don't overcomplicate it. For the younger people, take advantage of the fact that you are young. Right? And make sure that even though it seems like 
the most uncool thing to do. Nobody will, you don't have to go and tell somebody, you don't have to tell your friends that, oh, by the way, I started an SIP of 3,000 bucks a month or 5,000. But trust me, when you're 35 or 40 and you guys are doing a reunion, that's when you can tell them, you know what, by the way, I used to do this. Absolutely. And by the that's why I went to New Zealand for 20 days. <laughs> the last message, this is a bit of... Uh, Shall I say yourself or Rahul? You also read in the media so much about your passives and this and that. Trust me when I said, have patience, have courage, block out the noise. Otherwise, you make the big mistake. What basically stands between you and the big mistake is Rahul Katri and his team. I'm going to end here. This is the end of my presentation. I am happy to take any questions. Thank you. Many thanks, sir, for such an informative and entertaining session. Uh, may I please request the audience to fill in the question slips that are handed over to you in the bag. If you have your questions, please forward it to our team members, then they will bring ahead the questions here. the last slide. Probably start and then yeah, yeah. and then others can. Hello. Yeah, there's a question from Mr. Uday Amre. Can you explain more about Capex cycle and how it impacts the market? Yeah. So essentially, the Capex cycle means that if you go back to the various subsectors, there are lots of sectors. Take, for example, manuf basically related to manufacturing, cement, etc., that have for the last six or seven years <coughs> gone through difficult times because there hasn't, most of the capex has been by the government and it has been limited. There is a, if you looked at the slide, the capex that the government has done last year and this year as a percentage of GDP for the first time is equal to what it did in 2003 and 4. 
So effectively, if you think about the markets in 2005, 6, 7, which is, you know, when our industry created so many infra funds, you will not find infra funds being launched now. But effectively, it means that large parts of the market and companies within that, which we didn't invest in a lot at that point in time, are companies that you would want to think about very, very seriously today. So basically the CAPEX cycle, which is a given because this government is extremely clear that creating infrastructure is important, means that our ability to create a portfolio that is more diversified, which means it doesn't have to be 40% banks, 20% IT, 10% pharma, there will be a lot more of manufacturing companies within that is what I would say is the result of a CAPEX cycle of the scale that we are seeing today. Next question is from Mr. Apurva. Sir, how do you view the markets after India became the second or first economy in the world? Do we exit the market and invest somewhere else? So my answer to that is very simple. Just to clarify, we are the sixth largest economy today. The prediction is that we will become the third largest in six or seven years. That third largest is more a perspective of as Indians you will just be feeling happy that India did this right it's a, just a national from an investing perspective the simple context I bring it back today you're a three trillion dollar economy it is going to become a six trillion dollar economy market cap which is the equity market normally runs in line with that so if you believe in the next five or six years in theory the market is going to double why would you want to take your money out today that doesn't mean I'm clarifying because somewhere asset allocation plays a role. Everybody has different responsibilities and roles for their money. So it doesn't mean that 100 rupees. No, now as if I have told you some magical formula, if it is going to double, uh, every 100 rupees that I have should be in equity. That's not the point. But I would definitely say that for somebody who was questioning whether I should continue with my investment in equity or whether I should invest more in line with what my goals need to be, I would argue that yes, this is the time that you should feel confident about doing that from a three to five year perspective. Next question is, what are the major three risks you see to Indian growth market? Realistic risk, not theoretical. Yeah, so realistic I mentioned the first, which is uh, and the reason I mention it is very complicated is because it, I'm just saying the risk is China. Because it is a large economy coming out of COVID. What it does has implications, right? Because for example, let me give you one example. So people said that because central banks are doing what they are, inflation will eventually come off. But suddenly China has decided that they were going to stop their COVID policy and come out of COVID, which means China, which is the largest purchase of commodities in the world, suddenly starts buying commodities, which was not in the equation before. So now you have to rethink what inflation means because it's not going to come under control. You have to rethink what impact it may have on oil prices and so on and so forth. So I would say the one risk that you need to keep monitoring, when I say risk, you need to be very, very carefully monitoring what is happening in China and how they are navigating their post-COVID world. The second is effectively globally how the Fed reacts and I'll say why. The reason that our markets are where they are in the sense that yes it is 0% but you could argue that they could have been lower has been that domestic inflows into equity have continued to be strong, right? On the other hand, we've had 18 months of record FPI outflows. You know, foreign institutional investors have withdrawn from Indian markets in record numbers. So it's a risk and an opportunity, which is that if they start to believe that India relative to other markets makes a lot more sense, and therefore foreign institutional flows reverse, then that's a big opportunity on the converse because in their home markets they continue to face difficulties etc which means their clients are pushing them see ultimately who's a foreign institutional investor he's a mutual fund like us it's just that he's in the us he has collected money for an emerging markets mandate of which india is one of them so if his clients redeem then naturally he has to redeem his investments right so to me the second risk to think about is how do foreign institutional investors behave and allied to that how does fdi flows 
See, ultimately, India has been the beneficiary of significant FDI inflows in the last three to five years because it clearly is one of the best economies for global companies to invest money and create capacity. If they get into difficulties in their home markets, do they kind of take a risk off stance? Some of it is manifested, for example, if you see in technology company results last quarter. So I would say that's the second risk. And the third risk, uh, which I would say is a risk I'm willing to, I mean, I'm just calling it out. We have been a beneficiary of a very stable regime. Now, let me clarify, I have no political affiliations at all. I just have a market affiliation to consistent policy. Right? It's just like you as investors. You would love a fund that you're not looking for the number one fund. But you are definitely, when you invest, you would hope that that fund is decent most of the time. You're looking for consistency. One of the things we have benefited from is that since 2014, we've had the same regime and so therefore policy is in the same direction. Right? So effectively, I would say the general election next year, to my mind, would logically be the next other risk. Because obviously, if you have a change in government, if theoretically, then a lot of what I've said goes maybe out of the window because the new government may have a different worldview. Highly unlikely. Okay, I will also clarify that because, for example, if you remember, one of the biggest critics of Aadhaar was the current dispensation when it was done. And one of the biggest users of taking Aadhaar to the next level is also this dispensation. So it's not as if when there's a government change, they basically make sure that they throw everything out that the past did. But it's just helpful, I would say to the markets, if the current regime continues, not like I said because I have a political affiliation, but I'm just looking at it from a straight financial perspective, it just ensures continuity and continuity is always good for markets. So the next question is from Mr. Sanjay Suri. How do you balance out before, uh, between investing directly in equity and MF considering the short term and cash can uh, uh, cash you can get in equity, long term patience and wealth that can be generated in MFs? So I'll just narrow down the question to a very basic question, which is it's uh, should you invest directly in equity? I would say if you believe you have the ability, yes, please do it. But before you do it, you must honestly do an NAV on your direct equity like you do for mutual funds. And I think you'll find very surprising results. Because what happens is very natural. If you also ask me, uh, by the way, I very rarely do direct equity now. If I do direct equity, it's more in angel investing rather than anything else. But I'm just saying, if you ask me, I will automatically remember my success stories. Right, I bought this stock five years down the line, you know, before it's doubled, tripled. But I will say, no, no, you take all the stocks you did directly, put it together and buy, do a proper value. And then you discover, oh my God, the net result is 5%. That is number one. Number two, for a lot of the older people in this room, I would say that we have some amazing portfolio results when you look at 10, 15 years, but that is because we were fortunate enough to buy HDFC Bank or Infosys 15 years ago. But the reality is that bulk of the return happened 10 years ago. Now you can make a reference point today saying, see, I had invested 10 lakh rupees, it is now worth 5 crores. But my point is that the 10 lakh became 4.5 crores 5 years ago. The fact that 4.5 is only become 5, you forget. So. I repeat, if you believe that buying equity is your primary job, you should do it. If it is not your primary job, I would advise it is going to be very, very challenging. Uh, because, and I can just only say this from personal perspective, I have spent 26 years doing this. I mean, this is what I do, right? I oversee a team of portfolio managers that buy and sell equity every, every day. You would argue that I should have the ability to do direct equity myself, aside from regulations, etc., which obviously you need to pay heed to. I'm saying, irrespective of the regulations, I don't do it because I realize the most obvious thing, I have no time to look at my own portfolio. And I know one of the biggest damages to your portfolio is when you don't give attention to it, then there's only a natural consequence. I'll buy something at just 50 rupees, it will go to 150 rupees, it will come to 25 rupees, and I will be sitting and not even realizing that it has gone through that journey. So I'm not plugging mutual funds because I work in a mutual fund. I'm just plugging it saying, I think one should focus on your, your energies on your primary source of income and leave external people 
who do it at a relatively low cost to manage that for you so the next question is from dr uh, nalini is it good to invest in global equity markets global equity funds unfortunately the the window for that is closed uh, because of the rbi not allowing uh, further investments there are select funds which are open but i'll make a general comment because this gathering is not just you know what you supposed to do next week this is just a general interaction i would personally believe that over the next 2 3 years uh, as this india story plays out one of the things i've always seen in markets and it's a cliche right which is markets go up on rumors and sell on news so it's not like india indian equity market is not going to reach its peak when we become 6 trillion dollars highly likely that it will happen before that right and at that juncture you have to revisit the formula and say that do you have the right to become 12 trillion if i say however i want to diversify my risk then how do you diversify your risk if you are still wanting to invest in a wealth creating asset which is equity right i would believe even today irrespective of the fact that i am completely convinced that indian equity is a great long term story if i had the opportunity out of every 100 rupees i would put in equity personally i would put 20 outside because it's a just a question of respect right i mean there is it's india is not the only country and therefore sub component that is going to do well if i would give you a very basic it's a it's a very i'm simplifying it a lot but just so that you get the gist one of the things that obviously impact india is if oil prices go crazy right because as an economy given the amount of oil we import it's never been a good thing it historically has never been our economy is larger it will not be that much of an impact but there are economies in the world and consequently companies like brazil and russia who are exact opposite they do badly when oil prices fall because they are effectively a large part of their economy is linked to oil so if i have a situation where i am invested in indian equity and hopefully you've taken my advice and you don't invest and redeem invest and redeem you stay invested then why wouldn't you buy brazil equity because if oil is really doing well then there will be a couple of companies there that and and one of the advantages in some of those markets unlike india those markets are very concentrated So if you look at Taiwan and you look at the Taiwan equivalent of the Nifty, 70% are semiconductor companies. Similarly in Russia, although Russia is not an investable country at this point, 70% of Russian market cap is effectively oil. Same as Brazil. So I would say the answer Dr. Nalini is is I I personally believe even if it is the cost of the domestic Indian fund industry, diversifying global equity makes immense sense. not maybe to the extent of 50% but certainly 15 to 20% to my mind makes sense the next question is actually from ms nalini jeswani okay. she has interesting question for you sir is it a good time to buy stocks which one and why and is inflation a worrisome factor yeah so i can't answer stock specific questions uh, except to say that we run a mutual fund uh, effectively the top 10 stocks in each of our fund portfolio should be the stocks that you if you are still enamored by buying it directly you buy it because it's like i'm not, i'll be if i if i came up with a stock name which is a not in my portfolio then you as investors in my fund will say this is crazy you seem to have a different <laughs> list of stocks that are going to go up and for your investors in your fund have you bought so any mutual fund you ask them which are the stocks you would recommend it should be the stocks that are there in their portfolio now why would you want to go and buy it yourself when it's already there in the fund you might as well just buy the fund or stay invested in the fund that's answer number 1 so can you repeat the second part of the question inflation is a worrisome factor so like i said there will be multiple factors in 26 years and more of investing there are always been factors that are worrisome that is the beauty of markets that's how you make money if there was nothing worrisome which means some people will panic there is no opportunity so yes inflation is a concern uh china is potentially can be a concern oil prices are a concern monsoon being below normal is a concern uh, russia ukraine war spreading there was some ridiculous rumor some days back saying russia is going to invade uk that is also a concern finland is now part of nato so you know you if you decide you want to sit down and say let me list down the concerns it can be immeasurable the question is that do you believe that the economy here over the next 5 years 
through all of these concerns playing out in some form fashion will grow double eventually your equity market will reflect it through the concerns like i said every friday there's a movie sir i'll just add to that there was a joke which i have read once that uh, husband and wife are sitting and the husband says the important decisions of the house i make and she makes the smaller decisions of the house ki which grocery to buy what driver to uh, hire and what should be a monthly budget and things like that i make the more important decision should us invade russia should you can uh, should stop the war should us increase interest rates rbi should increasing right now is not correct thing what should your finance minister do those decisions i make in the house the smaller decisions my wife makes so the wife of the house is more definitely <laughs> i would say sensible to cater to such things and what sir is saying is let's leave all these things aside and it's more from that you should stick to your investment and stay put these these queries and uh, tensions will keep on coming and going for sure so i'll just proceed pravin r singh which are the five equity funds you are currently investing and why uh, so i won't name specific equity funds i don't think that's fair but i i have a lot of respect for canara rebeco i have a lot of respect for pgim i have a lot of respect for the money we run ourselves i have a lot of respect for mire i think they've created fantastic value over the last decade uh and i would say if i had to add a fifth union union <laughs> so it's a just a it's just a personal philosophy i have historically always invested in the funds that i work in uh it's mostly a function of the fact that i'm remarkably disorganized so i just figure the easiest thing to do is invest in my own funds because at least there i'll invest and if i have to redeem it's next door you know i have had the good fortune of working in fund companies where typically we've been upper quartile in terms of investment performance so it's never suffered and the point i also made in general the mean return average between 6 or 7 or 8 yeah. funds is nothing and you know eventually you'll get one better one so you'll say oh by the way the multi cap fund i bought that is like the third best multi cap fund over 3 years then you'll discover the small cap fund you bought is actually 27th out of 30th so overall everything put together you're pretty much at mean so why spend so much time and energy it's not worth it the bigger sorry let me make one. i think the biggest important thing you must remember is do you have the courage and the sense to be invested in equity that is far more important whether you are invested to the extent you should be is a thousand times more important than which one you have invested in uh, mr d arora investment advice for 75 years senior citizen mostly fixed income uh, i would say see of course i'll caveat that because uh, a number of you know if i look at my own late father i mean 70 80% of his portfolio was equity he, he is something he always did so he was comfortable and so if you are at a point in life where you know that the wealth you have has the ability to withstand anything and you know your regular income needs are very easily taken care of then i would say 50% equity 50% fixed income but the classic universal answer for a 75 year old i would give is typically 70% should be fixed income you have achieved all you needed to achieve with in terms of your goals most of them now you are just focused on enjoying the rest of your life so you effectively you need you don't need shocks right because let's say i don't know but i i know some i know my erstwhile boss who's now 75 he loves sport so he's always traveling to wimbledon and paris open and as i if he asked me what should i invest i'll say just make sure you invest such that you have money to go to the next wimbledon for the next 5 years 10 years because that's what should matter to you no so i my answer would be caveated with that mr pradeep has asked a question india has decided to trade in indian rupee instead of the us dollar with the g20 uh, due to which us is not so happy how do you look at it from a india market economy so i'll be very honest this this question is above my pay grade because this is a gigantic geopolitical question uh, one of the biggest success stories is the us managing to convince the rest of the world that the us dollar is the world's reserve currency 
which effectively means that the US practically never goes into a recession because it only prints more money. Uh, as other economies get larger, and obviously you have the Russia-Ukraine war as a, as a kind of a trigger, there is a conversation around uh, you know, can I pay for it in rupees, can I pay for it in renminbi, so on and so forth. Like I said, it's above my pay grade because I think there's a larger geopolitical thing going on. It's not an economic thing actually, right? So, is it going to be successful? If I have to be pushed to an answer, I think no. I think eventually the US dollar is such a large part of the reserve currency uh, that it will stay where it is. But yes, there are governments that are trying their best. From an Indian perspective, it's a win-win, right? Because see, we are a little bit of a strong arm regime at this point. I mean, we keep saying that we will do what is in our interest. You could argue in the past, perhaps we were a little subservient, which therefore means that if I have to import oil from Russia, because end of the day, oil imports are a large part of our economy, we'll do it. If it means that I have to pay them in rupees or pay them in dirhams, I will do it. And that's, I think, the call China is making. Does US, uh, will they say something about it that, that it pisses them off? They have to because they have an election coming. So they have to obviously show strong arm tactics that, you know, the US is the largest, biggest country in the world. So this is, like I said, it's above my pay grade, it's geopolitics. I think eventually it will all settle down. Uh, Mrs. Anita Mehta, which is more beneficial investing through mutual funds or PM, uh, sorry, PMS or SIPs? So I'll, I'll divide it in two parts. I think SIPs is generally a way of investing. Okay, so keep park that aside. Uh, you can invest in a lump sum fashion. Often I find that in a lump sum fashion, there are so many Friday movies that release that you actually don't end up doing what you're supposed to do, right? One of the good things about SIP is that you turn around and discover after six years, thank God, you know, while I spent so much energy thinking, should I invest, should I not invest? I ended up with 10 lakh rupees in my bank account, but fortunately this 25,000 SIP I did, I, it kept happening. Thank God for that. So I think SIP is that discipline. You remember, I, there was a, the discipline is really, really critical in investing and making money in equity as much as long term is. So that's the answer on SIP. As far as investing in funds and PMS is concerned, I would believe that these are all variants of the same thing, right? Mutual fund, PMS, ultimately you look at the net returns, all of them do. We all market differently. You know, PMS is a very dedicated portfolio for you. Now that you have so much money, why do you go to a product that somebody can buy with even 1000 rupees? This is for people who can invest 50 lakhs. I think behind all of that, you look at the net returns, it's pretty much the same. So. I can only put it, I mean, sometimes the best way of answering, have I invested in a PMS ever? Answer is no. Do I intend to? Answer is no. Because I don't see any PMS delivering a return profile that is significantly out of ordinary relative to the mutual fund. So I don't see any need. There is another element that I will bring to the table that you should just keep at the back of your mind. There are alternate investment funds, which is a now third vehicle. I would be wary of them because you need to be very, very, you need to also understand, you can't rely only on Rahul for AIF. Sometimes that's the thing na, that advisors will say and then I invest. In alternate investment funds, I would say an investor who's investing must have a degree of specialist knowledge as to why they are investing in that. So I'll give you an example. There may be somebody in this room, so right now, I it's not like I'm, by the way, saying that it's an investable thing. But somebody is doing a logistics warehousing AIF. And there is a fair argument, right? Logistics warehousing is a fairly important part of how the economic construct. Now, why am I not investing? Because beyond a point, I don't understand it. But let's say somebody in this room who's in this business, who understands it, and then understands that there is actually a lot of sense, they consider it. But I, my short answer is, between MFs and PMS, I'm not even getting the tax arbitrage into the picture. I'm not even getting there. I'm just basically saying that they're all the same thing, then why waste time? Mr. Ravi Jadwani has asked the question, is mutual fund with low NAV better? No, there's no relevance of low NAV. It's like valuation, right? Is the Sensex better at 57,000 versus 54,000? Answer is no. Effectively, it's the price earning multiple that is actually the definition of whether something is cheap or not. Similarly, in mutual fund, the NAV being low does not give me any right to outperform. 
unfortunately it's a human instinct which is why when we launched this nfo at 10 rupees people still think that the 10 rupees has a ability to rise faster than the existing fund with an nav of 125 rupees but nav is irrelevant to the buying decision it should be completely irrelevant so low nav high nav is not relevant the fund company and how they manage the money is what is relevant mr dn mishra which is better land stroke flat purchase or sip investment so i would say that if you had asked me this question 20 years ago i would have had i would have still said sip and i would have been proven wrong but i think the story see what what is sips and stuff their equity equity is a risk asset right because when you 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 take risk because you want to earn a return which is double digit and creates wealth what is the only other part in the way as indians we could invest which had the ability to create genuine wealth you can't say i invested in fd and created wealth right because 6 7% or 8% can only get you so much so property or real estate frankly in if you look at since 1990 till about now has been the one other asset class whose actual compounded returns stack up pretty favorably versus equity but the ability for property to reinvent and continue to become multi bagger i think is long gone so i would say that it was a limited opportunity for all the gray head people in this room it is done there may be a and there is obviously never a complete answer no it's not like all realist it's not like you can't buy a property i mean a lot of you i know are residents in pavai right i mean so for example if you had the foresight 10 15 20 years ago and even if you didn't have the money but you had the foresight and you just took a call took a loan and bought something in pavai it's obviously up three four times and so therefore when you put that against an equity chart that also gave 16% compounded this also gave 16% compounded but when i buy a company i like to see in the next 7 8 years can this company grow 3x i probably am able to convince myself a lot more our pavai property price is going to grow 3x in the next 7 8 years from where they are today that's the answer which to my mind so therefore then it boils down to the only thing where you can then still get is land and i would say in india sadly the protection around land is very limited right so you may end up buying something somewhere saying that there is an express way being built from delhi to mumbai so then in this pocket there will be some kind of development so aap ye thoda sa one acre plot lo but there are horror stories that occur around that so unless and until there is somebody you know extremely well etc then it becomes a viable investment decision so i would say that now real estate very very challenging next question is from mr kaushal shrivastav may you throw some insight on swp as to which percentage of sw should be saved so that the capital should also continue to grow no so that's a tough one that i think is related to let's say uh you can do an swp from any fund you have done right systematic withdrawal plan is just a more tax efficient vehicle now because of the recent tax changes in in fixed income i would assume that all the sheets you have been shown in the past on how swp is more efficient than a dividend option or anything of that sort to get a regular income that gets thrown out of the window because obviously all swps will also get taxed at a marginal rate now if you say that no i am a little more confident about the long term characteristics of equity so i will invest in equity but i need some income generation because of my expenditures etc i would say in equity looking at the next 5 7 years you can make a fair assumption of a 10 12% compounded return which means that therefore if you run an swp at 8% uh, you are in a situation where at the end of 5 years you have some capital appreciation and you have some swp as well but bear in mind i will just make one point uh, i i i think the way the government's taxation policy seem to be i would believe in the next 3 4 years all these tax efficient ways of getting income all of that will disappear because the government seems very clear that tax and investments should not be commingled they do not want an investment that is should be seen as superior because it is more tax efficient they are going to take that word out every successive budget you find that happening 
uh, SWB, like I said, therefore, I think in the recent tax changes becomes much less relevant. Dr. Rina Jana has asked for how an NRI can invest in MF market of India and in cash uh, and in case the profit in uh, what kind of liability he or she needs to be careful. No, so for NRIs, uh, I think they will invest in a equity or a debt fund just like a resident Indian would. I mean, that's uh, it's fairly simplistic. The tax treatments now are fairly similar. The only caveat that I can just point out is that. Uh, most mutual funds, uh, it's a lot tougher for NRIs who are citizens of the US and Canada. Simply because the US and Canada governments have rules that are very complicated. right? Because unlike a lot of other jurisdictions, the US taxation mode is such that I tax all your income irrespective of where it was generated. right? So they also put onerous things on us as manufacturers saying that if you have a US citizen investing then you have to report XYZ, you are liable for XYZ. So most mutual funds don't take money from US or Canadian NRIs or they take it with caveats. But if it's a general question then I would say an NRI can invest in Indian equity uh, pretty much similar to, to others. I will also make this point uh, anti my own industry but I think the returns you get from FCNR, etc. deposits are so attractive that for an NRI, the focus on investing in mutual funds should be restricted to equity funds. I don't see the sense in NRIs buying fixed income funds. Uh, Mr. R. Muttu Krishnan, SIP is better or invest in new MFs which, uh, which will give better yields? So I am clarifying one th again, uh, a new fund offer, it's like an IPO, right? Companies come up with IPOs and sometimes those IPOs are unique sectors, new sectors, so therefore it may make some sense to look at it. But very often there are IPOs of companies that come in similar sectors. Now you have to, for NFOs from mutual funds, you have to put it in two buckets. There are some mutual funds that are relatively newer like us, right? So for example, in December of last year, we did a small cap NFO. Now were we, was it a gimmick trying to, because people were saying small cap makes sense? The answer was no, we just don't have a small cap fund. So we decided to launch and for a, as a customer you would say okay I like Mahindra for example so I don't mind looking at small cap because I'm looking at it as a space. But other than that in general I would say concentrate your investments in five or six mutual funds and more often than not 90% of them should be in existing mutual funds. <coughs> New fund offer should appeal to you only if it is a genuinely unique idea which I think happens to be the case 2% of the time. The rest of the time, it is a marketing effort. It's not an investment effort. Mr. Gautam Kar, mutual funds are returning very minimally recently. Do you feel any betterment in a short term? No, no. In the short term, I have no idea. That's my answer. I, nobody has an idea, not just me. I'm, I mean, whether the markets... See, ultimately, the mutual fund delivers you a return that the underlying market is allowing the mutual fund to provide, right? So if the equity markets have been flat in the last 18 months, uh, it's very difficult to foresee that mutual funds on average will be 10% or 12%. It will be in line with that. Over the next three to five years, is there a reason to believe that equity will do well? The answer is yes. In the next nine months, is there a reason to believe that I should invest in equity because one year later you should be happy? I would say that the chances are lesser than 50 percent. Yeah, There's a question from Mr. Dinesh Arya. Will, uh, with China getting back into economic revival, how will it impact chemical plus pharma sector? So my answer is that it's a, it's a long answer and it is extremely company specific, right? When you look at chemicals, every chemical company has an opportunity which is different. Every pharmaceutical company, you can break it up in subcategories, right? There are pharma companies that thrive because they are selling to Indian domestic customers. There are pharma companies that basically make generic drugs that they sell in the US. There are pharma companies that are contract manufacturers. So it's a very company specific uh, answer. There are opportunities for chemical companies, etc. But it's, I wouldn't make a broad brush statement saying they're all good or they're all bad. Uh, Mr. Dinesh Bagelkar, how much amount I should invest in small, mid, large funds as per my monthly income? 
I would say just buy a diversified flexi cap or multi cap fund which invests in small, mid and large cap. No, don't have to worry about specifically choosing sub category. Next question is supposing I am uh, known anything uh, customer very low risk profile not very greedy but small greed is indeed uh, funds which are the funds better uh, complete job of managing my finance so if you are a kind of a slightly risk averse customer who is moving from only being comfortable in the past with fixed deposits or bank deposits but now understand the little bit of the magic of equity but not willing to take the volatility doesn't want it i would say there's a category of mutual funds called equity savings which basically have on average 15 20% equity the rest is typically fixed income i would say that would be the natural port of call for an investor like that so we've got a question from online yeah. uh, now with the new tax regime what is the future of ELSS mutual fund and is it advisable to invest in them so if within your own tax planning as a salaried employee if you are still going to be able to claim the benefit then yes ELSS still makes sense otherwise you know move on to just buying normal equity funds for your needs to that extent if somebody doesn't have the tax benefit because of the way you know if you are choosing the new tax regime then it doesn't have any relevance then ELSS also has no relevance I mean then it's, you can choose any fund you want to. There's a question from Mr. Nayan. Should you uh, should one keep booking uh, booking always or booking profits is important? If one should and when, and should one invest in China or US now? If no, why? So booking profits, I think, is a larger question which relates to your own overall personal finance situation and whether you are reaching your goals and if you've reached some of it, it's sometimes helpful to take money off the table. I would not recommend trying to adopt it on a mutual fund or an equity market beyond a point. I am just saying that let's say today the market is whatever 17,000 nifty and for some crazy reason it becomes 30,000 nifty in a year from now. It is quite obvious that that is extremely richly valued. Should you on an overall basis take some money off the table and put it in fixed income or cash? The answer is yes. But it's not related to individual funds that you keep making these kind of decisions. It's at an overall portfolio level. China and US, yes, there are some mutual funds that give you the opportunity to buy, you know, as a feeder fund. Uh, between the two, if I had to be pushed to an answer, I would probably be open to buying a China related fund, not necessarily so much a US related fund. Ms. Jyoti, what's the best type of fund the, uh, to invest if you're looking for five to seven years? A diversified uh, flexi cap or multi cap fund. Mr. Shri is asked, does REITs make any sense to invest real estate investment trust in the portfolio? At some point in time, yes. I think real estate, somebody did ask the question earlier about whether the real estate makes sense. I think the scope of buying real estate directly has become much tougher. I think in time you will have more real estate investment trusts that will make sense. But I'll also clarify uh, the the recent budget has made the tax laws fairly unattractive for REITs. Number one, number two, most of the REITs available right now are mostly income generating REITs. So it's not a substitute for your erstwhile multi bagger flat purchase which went up three times, right? It is more a better income than an FD that alternative and I would believe keep and watch out for it in the years to come. I think REITs will become, forget REITs, by the way there are lots of interesting investment trusts coming on renewable energy, there are investment trusts that will come on infrastructure, so there are you know invits, REITs, all of that will emerge as options over the next three to five years but the way they seem to be more or less constructed, they seem to be constructed as alternatives to income, fixed income, not they are not being constructed as you know somehow you buy this REIT and it will double that's not the objective these are more REITs which will take your money and effectively be doing commercial real estate so that the typical rentals in commercial real estate are higher than typically the rentals on residential so the next question I'm a little scared to read it out if taxation is going to go and MF tax at income slab instead of churning the portfolio isn't it uh, better 
to invest in a particular index fund if the taxation is going to go no taxation is by the way going to be common to an index fund and a diversified equity fund so there is no that i can give you a guarantee on but they're saying that if it goes the taxation no, aspect no, whatever goes, taxation okay. will go the taxation will go for an index fund and an, an equity fund so frankly the argument today is the same right why do you invest in an equity fund which is active managed by somebody why don't you invest in an index fund it's taxation doesn't need to go for you to answer that question okay. i i would just basically say that as an industry it is far tougher for us to be able to justify large cap funds versus the index because it's very you know you have only 50 companies information is available to everybody so if you're charging an expense ratio on a large cap fund that's let's say one one and a half percent are you able to therefore generate extra over the one and a half percent to beat the benchmark becoming more and more challenging but anything outside of that multi cap flexi cap etc i think at least for the next five to seven years won't be a worry and i'm clarifying tax treatment is identical for index and a normal equity fund so it doesn't whether if you're debating it it's the same debate today it will be the same debate if tax is taken out so the last last couple of questions mr vijay morya on 4th april my son completes 18 years in which mf or something other investments we should look to invest mf gold other investment options and amount to be invested started from how much amount to be started amount invested uh, ideally i would say uh, firstly convince your son to invest some of the money himself rather than you investing for him because then you might as well just keep investing your own money it doesn't matter uh, i think the best thing is that if the if his son i mean he may not be working so then that's fine but as an 18 year old i think there is no need to worry about you know risk and fixed income i mean 100% should be in equity at least at 18 if you can't take that chance then when will you so we get a lot of queries from clients as such saying that my child has turned 18 or 20 or 21 he started working so we encourage please you get get them to us we can definitely look to educate them and ensure that they stay invested for a long period of time mm -hmm. and not look at bothered about the uh, yeah. short term volatility and of an, the market and an sip for them tends to be the best thing because mm -hmm. to expect an 18 year old or a 20 year old to be as excited about equity as all of you are is a little too much i have a son in that range as well uh, so you kind of just convince them that it's not about in investment is not exciting to them but this you know if i start early i can become very rich that sounds good that that is something that is palatable so i think just getting them to start an sip in an equity product that is if you achieve that i think hats off anything beyond that i mean i will have to call you separately and ask for advice as to how did you manage that as well <laughs> So we had one one mother actually in the crowd itself, which has pushed her daughter about five years back to start investing in mutual funds. She happens to be an air hostess. During the pandemic, definitely we all know that the airline industry was down and shut. When she went back to her friends and said that I have X amount of portfolio, they were zapped and they were like, how can you have something like this? So she was very surprised that my mother has pushed me to get to something like this. And she was so, so happy. And the others were crying, although she used to cry earlier saying that mother, all are going partying, buying a new phone, buying this, buying that, and you're not allowing me anything. But the kind of joy that she got later on after three, five years and after the pandemic especially, it was like she's a little financially independent and she was really, really happy about it. Yeah, and sorry, can I clarify? It's I, I, I think one of the tough ones is if you are trying to convince them as it's an alternative to consumption. Because then it's like, you know, okay, then you should, the person will, and that's a legitimate argument. Oh, so you're saying I should become rich so that when I'm 55, I will enjoy. But by that time I'm 55, in the pub there is no 55-year-olds. <laughs> so I think the argument is to push them to somehow start an SIP, even if it's 1, 2,000 rupees, 3,000 then the magic of what happens with that by the time they're 25 that itself should be the thing that puts provokes them to do it the moment you put this as an alternative to you know you went out for dinner last week if you had not gone out for dinner and put it then we are creating a rival to it which frankly a youngster says this is all good this is for your generation <laughs> right that's the reality so i would say that for youngsters we should just focus on getting the savings habit inculcated even if it is by default or through a small lie, it is, but just do it. Then let the investment take care of the remaining convincing. 
So the last question from Ms. Parul Mathur. Talk of some big Indian companies to be split up to avoid perils of monopoly. What kind of impact could happen if such companies are split up under any law passed by the government? Is this move advisable? So I don't know if I can think of too many companies that have already become so large. Uh, there are groups that are obviously extremely large, etc. There's uh, been a lot of conversation around uh, that in recent times. But I don't think in our markets that should be a worry. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, there are many companies who have chosen to go down those paths because they believe they can extract better value for them as a market cap if they listed companies separately. Right? So you have a large company, I mean, let me give you a classic example, there is a large company that recently demerged its financial services and its pharmaceutical business. Because sometimes what is happening is the pharmaceutical business and the financial services business were crossing each other out. So as an aggregate, it was not getting the kind of returns or market treatment it believed. On the converse, you now have obviously a situation where the largest housing finance company and the largest private sector bank are merging. Right. So you would argue that it becomes even more larger. So these things happen. I, it's, it's a specific stock by stock situation. I don't think the government is ever going to get into this beyond a point. Sir, I would just like to sum up. Uh, it was a very well done presentation, sir. Thank, thank you. you so much and taking out time to come and present to our crowd over here. And thank, thank you so much for all of you as well for coming over here encouraging us over again and again to do this kind of a session. Uh, just wanted to check, sir, uh, you mentioned about buy when it is low. Don't bother about what happens, how it happens. Just keep on investing. Best time are made in, best investments are made in the most disparate time. Especially in 2020, we, when we are sitting at home, our, my only thing was just go and talk to our uh, dear clients and just Educate them that this is actually a time when markets are low. We don't know. Like in theory, I have learned over the period of time that invest when the markets are low or invest when there is fear in the market. That's it. So a lot of people came back to us saying that Rahul, this time might be different. But time and again, the theory has proved right. Ki when you invest, when the times are bad, definitely the outcome over the years, your returns definitely will be really good. We always go and rush towards a mall when there is a sale. But we get very fearful when there is a sale happening in the stock market. The digital world is changing us really fast, which we, might, we will definitely have to adopt and change with the times. India as a government has been putting a lot of emphasis on infrastructure. As Sir mentioned that there's a lot of infrastructure, not only in Mumbai on the metro, but across the country especially the golden quadrilateral and your metro stations, metro connectivity, the trains, uh, uh, the recent uh, trains that the government has been launching, they are connecting, making things faster, the GST, your RERA, all these new developments that the government has done is actually helping us to move from what Sir has mentioned from the 14th country in 2008 to the third largest country in the years to come. We get bogged down, we have to focus on the long-term potentials of India and Indian equity markets. We have to live with volatility, but time and again, instead of looking to buy different sectors, we should buy some good diversified funds and ensure that our portfolio grows over time. Thank you, sir. Your last slide, which you mentioned of Mr. Warren Buffet, cash plus patience plus courage, is the best slide I could think in today's presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Would you just like to felicitate you? Uh, that yeah, can you? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are uh, now active on social media and you would have noticed that this event has been covered by Facebook and uh, YouTube. We request you to also scan the QR code and visit our page and review us on platforms like Google. It is my honor to propose a vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. Let me first of all start by giving glory to the Almighty before making this event a resounding success. 
First and foremost, I extend my senior thank sincere thanks to Mr. Anthony Heredia, who, despite of his busy schedule, found time to grace the occasion. Thank you. My sincere gratitude to his team, Mr. Pankaj, Mr. Gunjan, and Mr. Anup Jadhav for all the coordination and cooperation every time. My heartfelt thanks to the distinguished audience to be present here and who has willingly accepted our invite to be a part of this. I also would like to thank the social media team for covering this event so effectively. I want to humbly thank the venue partner, Rodas Ecotel, for their kind hospitality and service. A special mention to the Good Hearts, that's our good team, who has been effortlessly working towards making this event a great success. Last but not the least, my warm thanks to all the well-wishers and supporters of Param Investments. So my dear audience and sir, may you have a good Sunday. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, 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 no.